Thank you very much. Well, aloha. aloha. So no one has ever successfully bet against this guy when it comes to the theory of relativity, not even Einstein. And uh, tonight I'm going to weave through my talk uh, the, some of the aspects of relativity. There are actually two theories, the general theory and the special theory. The general theory is about gravity, and that's what we're talking about. So this starts back in uh, actually 1915 when he came up with the theory, and then a little later came up with the so-called field equations that described how the universe evolves. And at the time, the universe was known to be static. It was neither expanding nor contracting, but his field equations didn't predict that. So he added a, a constant, which was permitted mathematically, uh, and the so-called cosmological constant. And then lo and behold, a decade later, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was indeed expanding. And so Einstein said, uh, well, what he actually said was that was the greatest blunder of my career, and tried to persuade people to take it out of his field equation. But no one actually wanted to do that. And uh, then six decades later, that field equation term turned out to be an accurate description of one of the greatest mysteries and greatest discoveries of the last 20 years in astronomy the discovery of dark energy. And it's the story that is tightly wound into discovery at the Keck Observatory. So uh, tonight we're going to cover a lot of ground from the very origins of the universe uh, through its evolution to, uh, to where it is today in a time sense that covers the first uh, hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second through the next 13,700 million years. So it's a long time scale. And we'll try and get it covered in a little under an hour here. <laughs> now, um, this is actually um, my motley crew. As you heard, I'm the director of the Keck Observatory. It's based in Waimea. If you look on a map, you actually won't find Waimea. But it's in Hawaii. Take it from me. And uh, these are the people that work with me to, to run the observatory and make it successful. I've been at Keck for 32 years. I was one of the original design engineers working on the software systems, and I've done everything along the way. Um, and it's my great honor to be associated with what is actually the most productive two telescopes on the planet. So uh, by the way, this is what a blunder looks like if you're Einstein. Um, it's actually the only equation. This is the, the lambda term, the so-called cosmological constant. And it was needed to make the universe static uh, when he thought that was the, the way the world worked. And it describes accurately, mathematically, it describes this unknown quantity dark energy. All right. So astronomy, when you think about it, is really a strange science. I mean, first of all, it, it, there's a lot of hubris associated with it. I mean, we sit here on this tiny little planet and in a uh, rather unremarkable uh, um, galaxy far from uh, all the action. And from there, we presume to understand everything. You know, the, the origin of the universe, how it evolves, everything in it, uh, its ultimate fate. And largely, you can't, uh, you can only look. So it's a look, don't touch kind of scenario here. Uh, the only, occasionally, the universe reaches out and touches you, but that's usually not a good thing. I mean, the dinosaurs found that out 65 million years ago. So, so that's the first problem. The second thing is you can't do any experiments. You can do clever statistical things because there are billions and billions of objects, but you can't actually arrange anything directly. Um, and then everything is incredibly far away. You know, the nearest object, we can only explore the very nearest objects. The moon. If you travel at the speed of light, it takes a little over a second to get there. But we, try, we observe things that are, that where light takes 13.2 billion years to, to come from it to us. So the distances are unimaginably vast, and we explore only the very, very closest thing. And then everything's in the past. When you look at the moon, you see the light as it was a little over a second ago. When you look at Pluto, you see it as it was five hours ago. The nearest stars, four years ago. And uh, the, as I said, the most distant, distant objects we see, the light has been traveling to us for a little over 13 billion years. So it's really hard, actually, to do the science, but we do it. And to do that, we mostly look in the electromagnetic spectrum uh, of light. So um, there's a number of different facilities we use. Everyone's familiar with this one, Hubble Space Telescope. It orbits about 320-something miles above the Earth. And it studies light from the ultraviolet 
through the visible into the far infrared. And uh, you can have one of these for about $14 billion. Um, and it actually retrofitted with new optics. Uh, this is the, this is the, actually I like to tell people the problem with Hubble was never quite as bad as it was portrayed and the fix was never quite as good. But nevertheless, it was a fantastic machine. This is ALMA, it's an array of 64 radio telescopes um, up in uh, the high Andes, a uh, plateau called Shajnantor. And uh, it observes in the millimeter range of, of light, so the wavelengths of light are a millimeter, more or less uh, of the same order as the uh, radiation you use to cook your food in your microwave oven. But it studies the very coldest objects in the universe, ice cold clouds of dust and gas where planets are being born or stars are being born. This is Ice Cube, and its detectors are a mile down in the ice in Antarctica. It's to study neutrinos, which come from the most energetic things in the world. I always find this ironic that Microwaves study the coldest things, and the coldest things are studied in the hottest place, or the other way around. <laughs> and then finally, this is LIGO, one of the LIGO observatories. It's a gravitational wave observatory, and it just turned on a few years ago and immediately discovered black holes merging, and more recently, neutron stars merging. It's revolutionizing how we do astronomy. So that's a, a range of the observatories. And then there's my, my personal favorite, this one, uh, the Keck Observatories on top of Mauna Kea. Some have called it the Sistine Chapel of astronomy. It's certainly the jewel in the crown of the research facilities of the University of California and the California Institute of Technology. And those are the two main owner partners of this facility. So a beautiful telescope and beautiful location. So I have a, a, a number of things I can do as a director. I can, uh, I can fix the weather. Well, occasionally I fix the weather. Uh, but I can also make you astronomers for the next hour. And so by the powers vested in me, I declare you all astronomers of the Keck Observatory. And so uh, I'm going to walk you through what, what the next hour is going to be like. And so you've, uh, you've uh, driven up to our halfway facility, Halipahaku, at the 9,000-foot level on Mauna Kea. And um, you've acclimated for an hour. You had dinner, uh, gourmet food, you know, spaghetti and meatballs, um, <laughs> sometimes ono oh miso. Um, and uh, you started driving up the mountain to the observatory, to the telescopes. And about here, about 11,000 feet, you realize you probably shouldn't have had that third helping of ice cream. <laughs> You're not feeling so great. And, but perhaps inspired by the beauty of the location, you stop, you pull over, and you start contemplating you know, the big questions of life. You know. What is it that makes us, us human? And so I, I can tell you. That it turns out it's not having opposable thumbs, and it's not the ability to laugh, uh, certainly not the ability to overeat. No, no, my friends, it's curiosity. We are insatiably curious. That's, what we are. That's the human species. We want to know. We want to understand everything. It's what drives science, it's what drives discovery, and of course, I believe, it's the ultimate sal salvation of us, of us as a species. So, very important, and it is the way we, we behave. So, okay, you've, now you've had your big thought, turn around, that's Mauna Loa in the background, and you drive up to the summit, and you come to the summit of Mauna Kea, um, in uh, beautiful Hawaii, as we say there, Hawaii Nei, which means beloved Hawaii. It's a stupendous place. It's up at 14,000 feet, um, it's often covered in snow and ice, uh, but on this occasion it's clear. These are the two Keck telescopes. Here's the Japanese National Telescope. This is another eight meter telescope. It's, it's a collection of the most productive astronomy observatories on the planet. And uh, a wonderful place, but also a site of great controversy. Uh, there are people who regard this as a cultural and uh, spiritual home, and uh, those uh, who feel that this is the a place we must preserve for astronomy. And those forces are in, in conflict, and you will read about it. Uh, there's a, we're trying to build a new telescope, a 30-meter telescope up there, and it's been a, uh, very challenging to get the community to, to come along with that. Nevertheless, a beautiful place you should visit. OK, now I'm going to turn to the story of Keck. And the story of Keck is actually largely the story of one man, this, this man, Jerry Nelson. When this picture was taken, I was a sophomore in, in college. Uh, Jerry uh, was faced with an insurmountable problem. At the time, back in the 70s, the biggest telescope we had was the Hale telescope, the 200-inch at Mount Palomar. And you just couldn't make a mirror bigger than that. Because the bigger you make it, 
the thicker you have to make it, the more it bends under its own weight, and the more it deforms as the temperature changes. So there was just no known way to make a bigger piece of glass, single piece of glass. And Jerry had a, a brilliant idea, and that was uh, literally break the mirror into pieces, in, into tiles, and then recombine it. And each of the tiles can be made very thin. They're about six feet across. And uh, you recombine it, and you have a single surface of glass. And, and then you can make your mirror as big as you like. As long as you have money, you can keep building it out. Um, it's, the money is actually a bit of a challenge. So this is, it sounds actually quite simple in theory, but in practice, it's just, it's fiendishly hard. Uh, we actually have the primary mirror of Keck, which is 10 meters across, uh, is made up of 36 segments, and there are six different shapes, and it's, uh, it has to be designed so that uh, you, can, you can polish these different shapes, you have to support it so it doesn't deflect under its own weight, and most importantly, you have to position each segment relative to its neighbor to about a four thousandth of the diameter of a human hair. And that is a big challenge. Each of these things weighs uh, 800 kilograms, just under a ton. Um, it's a non-trivial problem. But um, Jerry persuaded people that this was a great idea. The uh, U University of California and Caltech lined up behind it. And the Keck Foundation, after whom we named, uh, took a gigantic risk and invested, I think, a sixth of their endowment in the observatory. And it worked. Uh, so this is what a single segment looks like. This is actually hanging off a crane being lowered into the mirror. Um, you have to be very careful with these things. This is, to make one would cost you about $4 million, and you'd take years to do it. It's, it's cheaper by the dozen, turns out. Um, and to me, it's a thing of beauty. It's a, I mean, it's a tremendous uh, achievement of, of human ingenuity. And when you assemble them all, this is what it looks like. There's a human being for scale. This is the 36-segment, 10-meter Keck telescope, the most powerful telescopes on the planet. It has the light-gathering power, um, equivalent at uh, six million times the light gathering power of your eye and about two and a half thousand times the level of detail with one caveat that I'll come to in a minute. Uh, so it's, uh, and what makes a telescope powerful is the size of the primary mirror. The ma amazing thing about Keck is this is not the end of the technology, it's just the beginning. And all the next generation telescopes currently being built on the ground and the James Webb Space Telescope in space use the same technology. So quite a sight to behold. Uh, and it's what you need if you want to do the impossible. This is a first light image taken back in 1991, and it only had uh, a quarter of its segments in place, and it already at that point was as powerful as the most powerful t telescope on the planet. And the quote I have up here is from uh, Ed Stone, who some of you will know is the pr uh, principal investigator of the Voyager mission. So Ed, uh, the Voyager is still going. It's out past the end of our solar system, and Ed is still going decades later. And he said, we believed it could, now we know it does. And it was a huge leap of faith to build this telescope. Um, when we built it, when we took this image, we sent it to the world's leading optical designer at the time, uh, astronomical, for astronomical instrumentation. And he said, they faked it. But we hadn't, and we built a second telescope to prove it. And that was the Keck telescope. So uh, now I did mention there's another technology. The, the segmented mirror technology is our, our killer app. But the problem is the atmosphere is very turbulent. And when you look at objects through the atmosphere, they blur it out. You don't see fine detail. So there's a technology called adaptive optics, which allows you to sense the turbulence in the atmosphere. And we do it by projecting a laser up 66 miles up. There's a shell of sodium above the Earth. And um, that generates a little fake star. And then you can, you can sample the, the light coming down. You can tell how the the atmosphere is um, uh, turbulent, and you can bend some mirror, it's about this size, somewhere in the light path, a thousand times a second, and you get beautiful, clear images. This, by the way, is this telescope photobombing us is the Japanese National Telescope. But they, they've always want, want to be Keck, but they never will be. Yeah. In the distance, by the way, these are the lights of Waimea, the town I live in. This is a time exposure. It doesn't look quite that bright. But we're very, very concerned about uh, light pollution. and. Um, it turns out this concern is shared by biologists because it affects nocturnal creatures and people everywhere. Because when you look up in the night sky and all you see is the glow of the city lights, you've lost something of your heritage. And so people everywhere actually are trying to do something about light. And for us, it's critical. OK. Um, I think when it comes down to it, Keck is really three things. It's ideas, and it's people, and it's execution. We've already talked about the great ideas that 
the two killer apps that make Kick so great. Um, but it's also about people. This gentleman here is a cage fighter when he's not working for us. And uh, he's the leader of one of our technical crews. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter how good your people and how good your ideas are if you can't actually bring it all together in, in execution. At Keck, we have a motto. Our motto, which doesn't appear on any uh, poster or, or um, anywhere on our website, is get there first. Because in our game, there's no participation grade. grade. There's, no, there's no trophy for trying. Uh, you either succeed or you don't. And Keck has been phenomenally successful. So I'd like to turn a little bit to the science we do, give you some indication of it. And I'm going to start with uh, the Einstein's biggest blunder of his career, uh, the, this cosmological constant which turns out to describe this mysterious force called dark energy. So about uh, in 2011, these three gentlemen, Adam Reese, Saul, Saul Perlmutter, and um, uh, oh my goodness, I know he has a name. Brian Schmidt. Brian Schmidt, thank you. I was thinking of the life of Brian, but that didn't seem right. <laughs> uh, Brian Schmidt uh, got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of dark energy. Now, of course, it's a much bigger group of people than the three who actually got the award. One of my friends whose work was instrumental to, uh, to this discovery uh, likes to joke that it's not every day you wake up and don't win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it was a tremendous achievement. And what it was was the discovery that the universe was not only expanding, but the, ex the expansion rate was was changing, was accelerating. And it was done by studying uh, supernovae. This is an artist impression of a supernova, exploding stars. And they explode in a very characteristic way, the very characteristic uh, light and dimming of the light. And so uh, if you know um, how bright something is and you know how bright it appears, you can tell how far away it is. And by the color of the light, we can tell how far away it should be because the universe is expanding and the light gets reddened by that. And those two numbers disagreed. In fact, these were slightly dimmer than we expected, and the explanation is that the universe expansion rate is accelerating with time. So it was an amazing discovery. I've got here a map uh, of the cosmic microwave background. These little dots represent color, uh, temperature differences of 200 millionths of a degree Celsius. Um, so it's a remarkably uniform map. But using that data, for, with a completely independent line of reasoning, you can come up and show that the, the non-stuff part of the universe, the, no, the non-ordinary matter part, should make up about 70%, which is, in fact, this dark, dark energy, I'm sorry, not 70%, uh, the 97, the, no, 70%, the dark energy component. So we have a completely independent line of reasoning that verifies this amazing result. Um, so there's dark energy, it's two-thirds of the universe's mass, there's dark matter, uh, which is about a quarter, and then there's stuff gas, dust, what stuff you and me are made of. It's only 1 20th. And uh, the amazing thing is we only know, we've only given a label to dark energy. We know the universe expansion rate is accelerating, but we know nothing else about it except that Einstein's blunder describes it mathematically. And then there's dark matter, which we know slightly more about. We know the effect it has, and we know where we see it. But we also don't know where it is. So here's a little secret I'd like to share with you. When astronomers say dark, what they really mean is we don't know. And what I think of it as uh, is uh, it's employment for life because <laughs> we keep discovering more stuff. So that's, that's uh, I'm sorry, I should probably not have shared that with you. Now, <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> um, astronomers actually don't do enough um, liberal arts classes. So the professors here who are liberal arts um, uh, should really pay attention. We name things like, like the most distant object in the galaxy, EGS Y8P7. You'd think you could come up with a better name. And this is an image taken at the Keck Observatory a few years ago uh, of a galaxy. And uh, it's, it's, 13 point, its light has been traveling to us for 13.2 billion years. But because the universe is actually expanding, the object itself is much further away than that. If you could freeze the expansion of the universe right now, which you cannot, um, it would take light about 30 billion years to get there. So it's a long, long way away, but we can see it. And curiously enough, we should not be able to see this object because at, that, at the time when it was emitting light, the universe was full of neutral hydrogen, which would absorb the light would, and scatter it. So you wouldn't be able to see it. But we see it. And we think it's because this object is so energetic, it's made these little ionized holes in, the, in, the, in this neutral gas and allowed the, the light to escape. Eventually, all the gas became ionized and we can see things. But this is rather curious. Now, 
I told you this is a competitive game. And unfortunately, when I wrote this slide, this was true. But then not long after, it, it turned out uh, it's not actually the farthest. Uh, there's several other candidates. So this is the one, EGSY AP7. This stands for 8.7, by the way. Uh, but you can see there's two objects more distant yet. Um, uh, this one is discovered by Keck. This one's from ALMA and the Very Large Telescope. This is from the Space Telescope, although it's a little bit controversial. Just to give you a sense, the di this one is about 100 million um, light years farther out than this one. So you're right at the very edge of the observable universe. So it's still an amazing result. But sadly, it's not ours anymore. Now, I wanted to um, tell you that life as a director is not all fun and games. Sometimes you have to look at things like this. This is the instrument that made that discovery. It's called MOSFIRE. Our instrumentalists are a little bit more poetic. Um, and it's dangling off a crane about uh, 25 feet off the ground. That's about $18 million worth of hardware. And uh, for those of you who are fans of um, uh, Alice's Restaurant Massacre, um, in the immortal words of Officer Obi, there ain't nothing you can do about it. And indeed, there's not. The best thing for a director under these conditions is to be off the summit. And that's usually where I am when this happens. But we have to service this equipment from time to time. Now, I wanted to show you um, uh, this image. It's actually, a, this is an artist's impression. But it's of uh, data that we, used, that we took using the Keck Observatory and uh, using our most recent uh, instrument. And what you see is here's a galaxy embedded in a huge cloud of dust. And the galaxy is only about one-tenth of this, of this whole system. And most of the mass, by the way, in the universe is of these clouds and the gas in between galaxies. So um, if you were to blow that up, you would actually see uh, that little central area is what we typically see when we take an image of a galaxy. So this is a galaxy similar to ours. But you can see this is only one-tenth of the system that forms a galaxy. And this will have a couple of hundred billion stars like our sun in it, as our, our Milky Way does. There's other kinds of galaxies we have as well. And this one is something called an ultra-diffuse galaxy, which means it's really spread out very faint. It's got similar mass to our galaxy, similar number of, of stars. And the curious thing about this one is that it has these little blobs inside it, which are uh, globular clusters, clusters of thousands and thousands of stars. And there are about 10 of those in this ultra-diffuse galaxy. And we can see it with the, with the Keck telescope. And we can actually measure the light. Um, and you get a little a spectrum of the light, which allows you to tell how fast they're rotating around the center of the galaxy. And when you do that, you find they're moving rather slowly. And in fact, there's enough matter in this galaxy to explain their motions. And that sounds pretty obvious, except for the fact that all other galaxies are full of dark matter, and the, the visible matter, the regular matter, is only a small fraction. In our galaxy, it's only about uh, between 5 and 10 percent. So what does that matter? It matters because, you remember I said to you, you should not bet against Einstein. One of the ways people try and explain dark matter, one of the theories, is it's not, not stuff. It's an error in the, in the theory of gravity, and actually in the inverse square law. But this pretty much rules that out. Now, the, the we only have one sample so far, at least one that we've published. Uh, and we, it may turn out to be a fluke. But every time we look, in, uh, we, and Einstein's theory of relativity, general theory of relativity comes into play, it turns out to be right. So it's an unusual galaxy, not like the ones you normally see. Now, this is a little closer to home. This is uh, both the pictures taken with a Keck telescope and a model made of it. This is the center of our Milky Way. And we believe there's a supermassive black hole there, 4 million solar masses worth. And you can actually see these are uh, centroids of stars that we can measure traveling around this, this uh, black hole. Um, oh, and you can see the years winding about around over there. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful test of Einstein's theory because these stars get very close to this very, very intense gravitational field. And that allows us to probe that physics much more accurately than you can with any, any local, um, certainly any lab on Earth. Um, as it happens, this one here is called, I think that's SO2. Um, that one has just whipped around the, the black hole in the past couple of months. And we were observing it on a regular basis. So stay tuned. In the next month or two, we'll actually publish those um, results. But if I were you, I wouldn't bet against Einstein. But I can't share any more about, about it than that. Maybe it, will get, maybe it will be different. Now, this is another amazing result to me. And again, you may just think it's a couple of blobs. <laughs> but actually, what it is is planets 
orbiting around a star. There's a little uh, obscuration there, blocking the, most of the starlight. Some of it's leaking out. And these are actual images in the infrared taken of, of, of planets. Uh, on this, for this system, Pluto would be ab out about here somewhere. Um, this is something called HR 8799. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you're curious. And the part I love about this result was when we took it back in 2008, I think, we knew with absolute certainty that you could not make an image like this. You could not take an image of a planet. It was just impossible to do from the ground. You'd need to go into space, spend billions of dollars. But then people figured it out a way. And this is the story of astronomy and physics generally over and over. Just when you think it's impossible to do something, someone smart comes along and they find some technique. And they've been tracking these, this system for quite a few years, six, seven years now, or eight years, I think. Um, and it's a, we've even been able to get spectra, look at the color of light. We can tell something about the composition of the atmospheres of those planets. And this is a, a long, it's not our solar system. This is a completely different solar system. Unfortunately, you couldn't live on this. The reason we can see it is it's very young, and these planets are very hot, and so they're glowing in their own light. And the contrast between the star and the planets is a little less. It makes it easier to see. The other interesting result that Keck has been involved in right from the very beginning is the discovery of planets around other stars using indirect means. The last picture I showed you was a direct image, an actual picture. But we use a technique called the Doppler wobble technique. As a planet orbits around its parent star, it tugs on it, and the star wobbles a little bit, and the color of light changes in a very predictable way. And uh, using that, we were able to detect something like uh, 300 planets at Keck. And then along came a, a space mission, uh, Kepler, which uses a, looks at the shadow the, of the planet passing in front of the star. As the planet passes in front of its star, the light dips just a tiny bit, a fraction of a percent. And, uh, and so that gives you an estimate of the planet size. You can use this Doppler technique to get its mass, and then you can figure out its density. You can tell if it's made of gas or made of rock or something else. So it's an amazing result. Uh, we now know that stars like our sun, one in five stars like our sun, have a planet like of a similar scale to Earth, one to two times the mass of Earth, in what's called a habitable zone, where water can exist. And that's where we are looking for life. That is the motivation behind the search for planets, to find life elsewhere in the universe. One in five stars, Earth, sun-like stars, having an Earth-like planet means that for every man, woman, and child on Earth, there's a planet like Earth somewhere out there in our Milky Way. And remember, there are trillions of, of ga galaxies. So the there's lots of planets like Earth. This is actually a system quite close to us, which has uh, four planets. Two of them are, this is the habitable zone here. Two of them are right on the edge of the habitable zone. And I think this one is about 1.8 times the mass of Earth. So if you were on that planet, you'd weigh 1.8 times your current weight, which is not great, but you could survive. Uh, unfortunately, it's embedded in a dusty disk, so it's probably being pelted with comets and asteroids all the time. And, Unlikely life could survive there. But it proves that there are systems like, like ours, you know, the planet, a uh, sun like, a uh, star like our sun. This is an amazing area, by the way. And if you're a young astronomer, this is the area that you want to get involved in. Because um, what could be more exciting than the search for life? Now, most of us think that we will find life like a slime mold <laughs> sometime in the next couple of decades. But intelligent life is a different matter altogether, much harder proposition. We're looking because it would be foolish not to look. I mean, we may get lucky or unlucky, depending on your perspective. But uh, um, that's very tough to do, actually. There's, and just let me set your minds at rest. We have zero evidence of intelligent life anywhere other than on our planet. So I often get asked whether I believe there's intelligent life elsewhere. Astronomers get asked this all the time. And all of us have this you know, strong desire to believe it because there are so many planets billions and billions and billions of planets like the Earth. But there's no evidence whatsoever, none. And there's nothing at Roswell, and there's nothing hiding under the Keck Observatory. <laughs> We'd like, because if we found intelligent life, we'd be the first to tell you. I mean, it would be an amazing result. Might even get you a Nobel Prize. Oh, maybe you'd be the one person who didn't get the Nobel Prize. Now, I, want to, I mentioned this uh, technique called adaptive optics, where you take the turbulence out of the atmosphere. And I wanted to show you one of my favorite images. It's actually about 16 years old. And um, this is actually the, the same uh, planet. It's Uranus. There's two, two images. And this is what you see using the world's biggest telescope 
from the, from the surface of Earth when you look at Uranus. And it's not all that impressive. I mean, it's actually not blue. We've colored it blue. This is an infrared image. But you can see there's some sort of white band there, and maybe you can see there's something there. Um, but if you turn the adaptive optic system on, then it changes completely. And this is the, the image you get. It's spectacular. I mean, you can see there are rings, there are clouds. This is a cloud band that's shredded. Um, we know there's very, very high speed winds on Uranus. And suddenly you can do the kind of, of astrophysics that are just impossible to do from the ground. And remember I told you the bigger you make your telescope, the more detail you can see. Um, a telescope like Keck, a 10 meter, is four times the size of Hubble. Hubble is actually a small telescope. It just has the virtue of being above the atmosphere. But in the infrared, Keck can actually make sharper images than Hubble. And the same is true of the next generation of telescopes that's being built. So it's a spectacular advance. And uh, it really uh, it allows us to study phenomena that would be impossible to reach any other way. Um, so let me come back to my favorite gentleman here. And I want to relate a story that's actually told in the biography by Walter Isaacson. So back in 1931, Einstein and his wife Elsa were uh, visiting the 100-inch Hooker telescope on, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, it was the great telescope of its day. It was the Keck of its day. Uh, and that's the telescope where Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. You remember the my greatest blunder of my career comment came from that. Anyway, Einstein was there, and he was happily playing with all the controls. And I'm sure it was the director, because directors have a way of saying these kind of things, said, uh, you know, with this wonderful instrument, we can study the, the scope and the shape of the universe. And uh, Elsa, Einstein's wife, turned to him and said, well, my husband does that on the back of an old envelope. Uh, um, now, I can't admit I've ever had quite such a put down, but it would be, it would be kind of epic. Um, but it, you know, the, thing, the thing is that uh, the great ideas, the world-changing ones, they all come from one mind, one person's mind. But it's only working together collectively that we actually change the world. And to my way of thinking, Keck is the embodiment of those ideas. So thank you very much. Now, I'm very happy to take questions of anything that you would like to know about. And, uh, and I have 100 reserve slides, so you can stay here all night. I'm <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Could you say a few words about the contributions of Vera Rubin to the discovery of uh, dark matter? Well, so the question is, can I say anything about Vera Rubin's uh, contributions to the discovery of dark matter? My gr granddaughter and her great-granddaughter play together. Ah, OK. Well, I, I this question. well you, what you should do is you should enroll her in a fine school of astrophysics as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so Vera Rubin studied the rotational rate of, of uh, galaxies. And, and the, the interesting thing is that when you look at uh, the stars moving around in a galaxy. The galaxies are rotating. And the, um, the rates that the stars are rotating around the center is not consistent with the distribution of matter in the, in the galaxies. Um, and the only thing that explains it is that there has to be some other mass, some other uh, form of matter in there. But whatever that mass and that matter is, we can't, we can't see it. And so it's dubbed dark energy. It doesn't, I mean dark matter. It doesn't interact with, with uh, light, doesn't interact with other material except gravitationally. And so that's, that was the origin of, of dark, uh, well, one of the, the uh, key uh, factors that led people to postulate dark matter. It actually had been postulated long, a lot earlier by um, uh, Zwicky. Yeah. So if you're looking at other, there's other evidence too. When you look at clusters of galaxies, they're also rotating and they should fly apart, but they don't. So it was a very, very important um, addition to the body of knowledge that she produced. Yes, sir? What was the value of that constant you were talking about? The, you're talking about lambda? Oh, OK. So for 60 years, it was 0. That's, that's the way. This is the, this is the cosmological constant in the field Einstein's field equations. I thought it was a symbol that said infinity. I, I no. sort of thought that's what I No, for the first 60 years, we said it. Well, for the first 10 years, I don't know what value it was assigned, very small number. Um, but uh, then for the next 60 years, we just treated it as zero. 
because Einstein had wanted it to be dropped off the equation, but everyone else said, well, not so fast. Maybe you're onto something, which it turned out he was. <laughs> it's a small number. The units, it depends what units you're uh, describing it in. Yes, sir. So the segment, the question is how many different kinds of mirrors can adaptive optics be used on? The segments that I showed you, the segmented telescope uh, part, the primary mirror, is not anything to do with adaptive optics. It's actually called active optics, just to confuse the situation. And all we do with the segments is we can, uh, we can tilt them and tip them and, and piston them. And we do that to maintain the overall shape of the mirror. Adaptive optics uses a, a very thin mirror about uh, this diameter. And it has, in our case, about 300 little actuators, pH actuators on the back. And you can push on that very, very slightly, a thousand times a second. There are a few other technologies, um, but most of them are like that. There's a completely different one, which is MEMS-based. But uh, you know, um, the problem with MEMS is they have very small stroke. And so you have to design your system very differently. Is that called a tip-tilt? No, tip-tilt only refers to tipping and tilting, which you can also do very rapidly. At Keck, we have a tip-tilt mirror that can move at 50 times a second. It would cost us uh, five or six million dollars to build. We had Lockheed Martin Palo Alto Research Lab spent five years building it. And we brought it to the observatory, we commissioned it, and we immediately mothballed it. Because in those six years, technology advanced so far that we could use detector readout instead. And so I keep that as an object lesson to my engineers that you don't have an infinite amount of time to build a perfect machine. <laughs> Yes. Oh, OK. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, why are there two caps, and how many would you like to have? Oh, <laughs> how deep are your pockets? <laughs> OK, so, well, the real reason, actually, the two caps are used independently for the most part. Um, I have an image somewhere that shows them both looking at the Milky Way with, at the same time, the center of the Milky Way, with different instruments. We did, for a while, use them as an interferometer, combining the light of the two. And the, so one uh, totally oversimplified picture of an interferometer, but which gives you a sense of why it's important, is the bigger you make your primary mirror, the more detail you can see. So if you have a 10 meter mirror, you see a certain amount of detail. If you make that mirror 86 meters diameter, which coincidentally is the distance between the two kecks, um, you'd have uh, 8.6 times the level of detail you could see. Now take that 86 meter mirror and paint it all black except for two 10 meter circles at the end, at each end. And then you have a, a two kecks, basically. And you can combine the light of the two in using a t technique called interferometry. You get the same resolution, the same level of detail, but you get far less total light. So you don't see as faint as you would be able to with an 86 meter mirror. So the idea of using the two kecks as an interferometer was to get a factor of, of almost 10 times the resolution in the images we looked at. And we did that. NASA spent nearly $100 million building an interferometer. It's actually, when I told you we don't have any UFOs under the keck, if you come down there and if you get a tour, you'll see this amazing site with this incredibly high-tech uh, uh, set of instrumentation. There's 20 optical benches. There's laser metrology. There's instrumentation. And it's all under plastic. It's all covered up. <laughs> we used it for about five years to do a very specific study um, to understand if we could see planets outside, uh, you know, exoplanets. And then we shut the whole thing down. The plan had been to launch a, a successor mission into space, but it was never funded. So we spent a lot of money. We got some really exquisite science, um, but it's too niche. It, you can only look at bright objects. And so right now we have this like secret city. It looks like the Vulcan's just up and left. <laughs> um, so we, right now we use them as independent telescopes. There's, a, there's um, something like eight big telescopes, eight to 10 meter class telescopes in the world. We could probably use another uh, three or four quite productively. Um, but in fact, the emphasis now shifted to the next generation telescopes, which are bigger. The next one we're building in the US is a 30 meter, and the Europeans are building a 39 meter. So a 30 meter, three times the diameter of Keck, will have three times the resolution Although on what's called point sources, it'll actually have, uh, it goes up as the fourth power, 81 times the, the uh, sensitivity. So there's a lot of gain to building things bigger, bigger rather than more. That's a long answer to, I would like another keck if you can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> is there some other question? Yes, sir. Who all uses keck? 
Well, in principle, uh, let me tell you how you get time on a telescope like Hicks. So you as a researcher submit a proposal to a committee of your peers. It's called a time allocation committee. And the, the TAC, the time allocation committee, meets every six months. And then they, um, they judge all the proposals. So at Keck, depending on which TAC you apply to, the oversubscription rate is between 3 and 11 to 1. So if it's 11 to 1, that means for every 11 proposals, one gets time on the telescope. And you might get one night, or half a night, or a quarter night. So it's very, very uh, competitive. Now, in the, the owners of the Keck telescope are the University of California and Caltech. It's about 300 astronomers. NASA has a one-sixth share. And, and any astronomer in the United States can apply through NASA's time. And so NASA gets one sixth of our time. And the University of Hawaii gets a little bit of time too. So you'd think it would only be those communities. But when you look at the actual uh, authors of papers, it turns out to be international. So any good astronomer can get time through collaboration on Keck. Yes, sir. Huh. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, would the would the could we see a uh, is the resolution on the telescope good enough to see something on the scale of a person walking on the moon? So, first of all, if you pointed our telescope at the moon, I would fire you because <laughs> it would be a total waste of that thing, fantastic facility. But the answer is no. We don't. The, the magnification of Keck is not that high, and um, and honestly, we, we do look, the nearest objects we look at are objects in the asteroid belt. Um, we rarely look at anything that, uh, well, I guess we, looked at, we look at moons of, of Jupiter. We have occasionally looked at Mars to see if there's methane, um, because methane is associated with life. But for the most part, the only solar system objects we look at are the ones that are much farther out, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and then uh, the objects beyond that in the so-called Kuiper belt. In fact, the reason that Pluto was demoted from a planet came from research done by a guy called Mike Brown at Caltech using the Keck telescopes, because he found multiple other objects that were similar size. And we just, as I've already pointed out how we lack much imagination when it comes to naming things. So the idea of naming thousands of other planets was just too much for astronomers. And so, <laughs> well, there was a few other reasons, but yes. The 30 meter is proposed to be built uh, at, the, at Mauna Kea, just a little bit below Keck. There's a plateau below it. Um, but that's all held up in the courts right now. And so if the, if the court decision is unfavorable, if we don't get a permit to, to build, um, we're looking at an alternative site in the Canary Islands. Um, there's another t clone of Keck in the Canary Islands, um, although it's much less productive and much less advanced for sociological reasons, not technical ones. Um, and, but it's a very good site. So it's not as good as Mauna Kea. There'd be some compromising. But we'd rather have the telescope somewhere than not at all. But it's a, it's a huge challenge, actually, to, to get. These big projects are uh, multi-billion dollar projects. And any time there's money in, of that scale, all kinds of people come out. And some principled and some not so principled, I think, to oppose them. Yes, sir. Simple question. What's the focal length of the telescope? And what's your AU, which is a scaling unit? Oh, astronomical. Well, OK, so the, the question is, what's the focal length of the telescope? The primary is f1.75, so the focal length is 17 and a half meters. And uh, astronomical units is um, the uh, one AU is the distance from the sun to the Earth, 93 million miles. Other questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Can you tell us a little bit about your career trajectory? How did you get to where you are today? And then huh. if you're working with young people, um, school age people, or you have someone who you think, what could we do to nurture their interest in this? And what would you recommend? Okay, so the question is how did, how did someone like me ever become the director of the Keck Observatory, right? <laughs> 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 uh, so, well, let me, let me say, first of all, um, Actually, I'm an engineer, not an astronomer. I built telescopes. I built telescopes at one point, and I I have never forgotten how I got involved in this field. And it's because I was about 15 and I won some science competition. I grew up in Africa, in Namibia, very remote place, um, about the size of Texas, with a million people. 
And uh, no, there were no computers and there were no telescopes and there was very little actually. Uh, but I got to, I won this competition and I, was, I went to South Africa to visit a number of scientific institutions. And a, someone who was, was working at a NASA space tracking station um, took pity on the two or three of us there and, and spent a couple of hours telling us about astronomy. And I must have been 14 or 15 at the time. And it made a huge impression on me. I had, I had no, no knowledge at all of it, but I've never forgotten how important that was to getting me into astronomy. Um, so, uh, so the key thing is, I think, someone has to mentor a kid or turn them onto it, and that was what happened in my case. And um, I actually went by way of industry. I worked in chemical industry for a while, sort of DuPont-like uh, company, uh, and then ended up seeing an ad, I think I was on, I was signed up to do an MBA and I saw an ad for come help us build a telescope in a remote part of Australia and that's what I did. And I've been building telescopes ever since and well, eventually running them. Uh, yeah, so that's, now your question is what can we do to help kids? Um, I actually think in one sense the emphasis on STEM education is a little misplaced um, and, and that sense is that uh, we live in an incredibly complex society. You know, it's totally science-based. Everything around you is based on, on some as aspect of applied science. And we expect uh, our citizens to make informed decisions about whether it's vaccinations or pollution or climate change or any of number of large number of things. But we don't, we don't equip our kids to think about how to, how to address those questions. And so I, what I like to do is I like to uh, excite young people by astronomy, because it's a very visual field, you can get them turned on. But not so that it can make astronomers out of them, or engineers or physicists, but because I want kids everywhere to understand or to appreciate the beauty of science and to be turned on by it, and then learn how to think scientifically. So that's what I think is really the key. By the way, at Keck, we run a program called the Keck Scholars Program which I um, started because, and a, a couple of colleagues, because we were increasingly concerned with the number of graduate students and postdocs whose sole understanding of astronomy was through downloading big data sets. So they'd sit at a desk in a basement somewhere and, and look at data. But these are the very people who have to build the next generation of instrumentation and telescopes. So I wanted them to come to Hawaii, touch a telescope, feel it. I mean, you, not allowed to touch the glass, that's a firing offense. But you can touch everything else and work with our astronomers and engineers uh, as mentors. And we do that, we fund the whole cost of that, bring people out for a couple of weeks to a few months and then they, they get this hands-on experience. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Has the bog interrupted your work in the last year? Um, well, I, let me put it, yes. Has the bog interrupted our work? So there's, there's always VOG in Hawaii, but with the eruption starting in May, it got a heck of a lot worse. In fact, some days you couldn't see, the visibility might be half a mile. The telescopes are up at 14,000 feet, so they're largely above that. And um, it, the weather got a little bit worse, but it wasn't a substantial disruption. But a bigger problem was the level of sulfur dioxide in the air increased. And when sulfur dioxide gets onto optical surfaces or metals, it binds to it. And if it gets wet, you get sulfuric acid. So we had to shut down when the sulfur dioxide levels got high. But by and large, the telescopes were not affected. Now, it's a different matter for human beings. Of course, the people at the eruption had major uh, disruption to their life. And even where we were 60 miles away, it was quite unpleasant. So the eruption stopped in its entirety. I haven't seen the skies this clear in decades. And uh, I am keeping my fingers crossed. Yes. Oh, someone else? You had a question? Go ahead. Do you know um, how uniform is the distribution of dark matter compared to that of ordinary matter? Well, it's clumpy. I mean, wh what we think is galaxies form where there are clumps of dark matter. And so it's not uniformly distributed through the universe. It's not. No, 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 no. And the, the prevailing theory of galaxy formation is the dark matter clumps together and then regular matter falls into those gravity wells as well. Yes, sir. We've, we've heard that the James Webb Space Telescope that's supposed to be a successor to Hubble hmm. is a lot over budget and delayed. And I wonder from your manager point of view, if you look at that and 
what lessons to learn from that for future big hmm. astronomy or other science projects? Well, okay, I'd like to say that we would, I would do it differently, but I wouldn't. <laughs> it's, it's very challenging to build these, these telescopes. Um, first of all, you, n there's nothing production about it. You're always building something at the absolute limits of what you can do. And when you're building spacecraft, it gets infinitely harder because you have no possibility of fixing it. I mean, if Hubble, at least, you could have a service mission, which would cost you half a billion dollars. But the James Webb Space Telescope is too far away. It will be too far away for us to be able to reach it. So you have to engineer it for a very, very high degree of reliability. And that's just simply challenging. Now, having said that, the tragedy of all these big projects is it's not the hard stuff that gets you. It's always some, some, someone's overlooked something. And in fact, the latest delay in James Webb is a very uh, basic uh, problem that should not ever have happened. But it's a complex system, and, and human beings are not perfect. The, uh, a more interesting question for me is how much of our resources should we put into spacecraft and how much on the ground? And um, I showed you Mauna Kea with all the telescopes there. That total capital investment is a couple of billion dollars. And the operating investment, even if it's the same, is called another couple of billion. Um, so use three to four billion dollars for Mauna Kea. Hubble is about 14 billion dollars right now. It's been going for the last quarter century. The total scientific impact of Hubble is about 60% of the impact of Mauna Kea. So from a, if you were an economist, you'd say build on the ground. But Hubble can do things we just can't do on the ground. And that's much harder to weigh. You know, where's the big scientific breakthrough? So it's a, it, I would say we have it about right. Our real challenge is, from an uh, astronomer's point of view, is we're not investing enough in our facilities on the ground in the United States. The Europeans do a much better job, I think, of, uh, relative to their, their national budgets. So we could be better coordinated. We could, I think we should be spending more. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain to us the difference between dark energy and dark matter and when each was discovered? OK, what's the difference between dark energy and dark matter? If, if I could tell you that, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> so no. <laughs> yeah. So dark, because we can't see them. That's the first part. Dark matter, we can detect by its gravitational effect. We can see uh, the motions of stars in galaxies. We can see that galaxies don't fly apart when they rotate. We can see clusters of galaxies stuck together. And intriguingly, one of Einstein's predictions is that when light goes past a massive object, something that exerts gravity, it gets bent. And so it forms a crude lens. And you see these big arcs in the sky, which are uh, uh, um, gravitational lenses. And it actually gives you a magnification factor of you know, 16, 20, 30. You can see things way further away. And when you study it, quite often, there's nothing between you and the remote object. And so we, we surmise it's dark matter. So dark matter, you, there are many gravitational signatures of it. But what it is, we have no clue at all. I mean, there were theories, but they've been steadily disproved. Dark energy is a completely different phenomenon. We know the universe is expanding, and um, we know it's expanding more rapidly than it has been for the last couple of billion years. And so the thing that's pushing on it, we call dark energy, because energy. <laughs> Actually, a friend of mine said we call it dark energy because we hope to get funding from the Department of Energy. <laughs> Um, there's probably more truth to that than you know. Uh, so that's the, the distinction. If, 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 the if dark energy continues at its current rate, and there's no reason to think it will, in about 30 or 40 billion years' time, we'll, we'll get to what's called the Great Rip, where everything will be ripped apart and you'll be shredded. So uh, you probably don't want to hang around that long, but the plus side is you're probably not going to be around that long. <laughs> yes? No. Bang, now, there's no center. OK, so I actually thought that, uh, the question I was anticipating you were about to ask, I was close, but not there, was what is the universe expanding into? But since you didn't ask it, I won't explain it. But, <laughs> but it's like uh, you know, the analogy that's often used to understand why, we, from our perspective, everything is expanding away from us, is if you take a balloon that's uninflated and you draw little dots on it and you blow it up, from the perspective of any one dot, all the other dots are moving away from it. But there's no center to this expansion. But unfortunately, you can't ask the follow-up question, because it's. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. The identified that you can see that there is dark matter. 
can you give any indication or make any inference about the distribution of it in those areas where you found it? Well, the, people have made maps of it, actually, uh, based on the gravitational um, uh, uh, force that it exerts. And what you can tell is that galaxies are, in the whole tend to clump around those areas of dark matter. But it's a, it's a chicken and egg kind of argument, because you postulate that, that regular matter falls close to the dark matter, and then you say, well, now I can figure out the dark matter distribution. But when you look at maps of it, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're def definitely distributions, but it's not a uniform distribution of any kind. There's uh, one of the instruments we built at Keck. I showed you that image of a, of a galaxy embedded in a huge cloud of, of dust, a thousand times its, its volume. Um, it allow, we, by looking at these ga gas line, the, the flow of gas between galaxies, we can trace where the dark matter has to be. So we can generate maps within galaxies and maps between galaxies of dark, dark matter distribution. But having the distribution doesn't tell you what it is, of course. But it's one of the, one of the uh, angles of attack to try and understand this. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, are the legal arguments against building the 30 meter at your site, are, is that mainly driven by finances that other people want the money, or is it environmental? It, it's a very complex set of factors. So I'll tell you what some of them are. Um, as you know, the native Hawaiian kingdom was overthrown a little over 100 years ago. And there's people who would like to restore the kingdom. And for them, this is uh, a, a fight they, can, they perceive they might have some leverage in. Because the, the observatories are, in a sense, a soft target. I mean, we, we generate about $150 million of, of economic activity on the Big Island every year. So it's a, for a small community, it's significant. But it's not like the tourism industry. So you can try and blockade. If you stop astronomy or slow it down, you don't throw tens of thousands of people out of work. So there's, there's definitely the, the um, people who would like to restore the kingdom. There's people for whom it's a cultural or religious uh, icon. So there is a lot of significance to the mountain. It's the, the highest mountain on Earth measured from its base, and certainly the highest mountain in the Pacific. So it's always had um, important cultural aspects. And then there are people who are just opportunists. So it's a range of, of, um, of opponents. From a legal point of view, uh, the argument has not actually been that. The argument has been that the process used to grant the permit to build in this uh, conservation district, uh, that the process was flawed. And in fact, the state Supreme Court agreed with that and sent it back. The whole process has been redone. And it's been appealed again to the state Supreme Court. And we expect in a matter of a few months to get a resolution. My personal expectation is that the 30 meter telescope application will be judged legal and will be successful. But then the question is, will people blockade the site? You know, will they lie down in front of the bulldozers and things like that? So it's, it's hard to tell. We have a, uh, Keck is not part of the 30 meter telescope, although some of our owner partners are also in that consortium. But we believe if the 30 meter doesn't go forward, it would be a death blow for astronomy in Hawaii. And I think that would be very bad for Hawaii, and I think it would be very bad for the United States. We've seen it, this play out with high energy physics with the particle accelerator uh, going to, to Geneva, to CERN. And although US physicists and engineers get access to it, it's a totally different um, and lesser impact than building it and operating it in the US. So uh, someone who believes that uh, science is incredibly important to our economy and to our future I sincerely hope it gets built in Hawaii. Plus, I like Hawaii. <laughs> yes. How do you actually aim the telescope at something that's, you know, trillions of miles away? Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, you know, half a degree means you have more than millions and millions of miles. Right. How, how, do you, and how do you know when you're actually looking at what you think you're looking at? So the question. <laughs> The question is, how do we point the telescope at stars? And it's a very good, it's a very tough question. So the, the simple answer is the reason the stars appear to move, of course, is that the Earth is rotating. And the Earth rotates once every approximately 24 hours. There's this deep connection between time and astronomy because every time the same star appears in the same place, the Earth is rotated around once. So you call that 24 hours. So it starts by understanding the rotation rate of the Earth. And it's not uniform. In fact, it's always slowing down, and it, it has 
slight variations caused by things like um, the uh, uh, tectonic plate motion. Uh, the Earth itself wobbles in its orbit around the sun. Um, the, so there's, there's a whole series of, of slight corrections you've got to make to understand where the Earth is. This was all worked out over 100 years ago, 120 years ago. And so we use that basic theory um, to understand more or less where to point the telescope. Now the way you actually find a particular object is um, you, you have its coordinates, usually by reference to something nearby that you do know. And so you, when you look at the, at the image, you see you know, an area perhaps, in our case, uh, about the size of your fingernail held at arm's length. And you look for bright stars in that area that you recognize. And then you adjust the telescope so that everything appears in the right place. So that's how you start. But then how do you track it for the next five or six hours? And the key is to use something called uh, guiding. So the telescope itself bends and flexes and as the temperature changes, as, it's, as the tube moves in elevation. I like to tell high school kids that uh, telescopes prove to you that geometry doesn't work. You know, center rotations aren't the center, straight lines aren't straight, right angles aren't right angle. Nothing at the scale that we work at, none of that. You know, you're talking about a structure that's 400 tons and is 100 feet tall. Um, nothing is, is uh, fixed to that, those scales. So you actually, you calculate it all out and then you look at the stars you know and if you see them moving, you move the telescope slightly to correct it. And you just do that hour after hour. But it's not a trivial problem. Uh, our biggest inefficiency is setting up our fields in the, right in the first place. It can take you 10, 15 minutes sometimes to get everything exactly oriented. Yes, you have another question. That's good. Okay, so the question is, why can't I put you know, two observatories around the side of the planet and then a telescope beside the planet? And the answer is, we do. <laughs> we do that. We do that with radio telescopes. So radio telescopes look at light, but have a, where the wavelength of the light is much, much longer than the... Is that to um, look at the black hole at the center of the galaxy? We use it for that. Yeah, the, the reason for doing this is you get ultra high resolution. So the, the, the detail we can see is usually measured in, in fractions of an arc second. An arc second is a 3,600th of a degree. With adaptive optics, we can get down to 50 milli arc seconds, 50 thousandths of an arc second. And with interferometry on Keck, you can get down to about five. But with the, um, if you have radio telescopes on, on, you know, across the, we have them across the United States, you can get down to a factor of 100 below that. So we actually use this to look for very, very fine detail. But it's very tricky to combine the light from these things. You can't do it in optical beyond about the scale of a keck. So we can take a few more questions, and then I should let you go. Uh, I find uh, dark matter to be a fascinating thing to think about. Uh, there's antimatter, too, that's unstable. Right. Right. Is there any relationship between the two, or is there anyone asking that question? As if, if, if antimatter could find stability out in the universe like that. So, yeah. so the question is, what's the connection between antimatter and dark energy, I think, right? Yeah. Oh, dark matter? Yeah. So uh, there's no connection. Antimatter is not unstable. It's just that if antimatter encounters matter, it annihilates, they annihilate each other. So you don't want to bring them together. But it's perfectly stable in itself. Oh, okay. So yeah, no, they're, they're, they're unconnected. Yes, sir? It is. It is actually. Yeah. How challenging is it to work at 14,000 feet? I'll tell you an, a, a story which I'm pretty sure is apocryphal because I heard it at Keck, but I've also heard it from other observatories. And that is of a technician calling down to headquarters and saying, I've cut the steel bar three times and it's still too short. And <laughs> that's, that's actually the way it works. It's very different. We don't, the astronomers, <laughs> it's true. Um, the, the astronomers uh, don't work at the observatory. We, we haven't had astronomers at 14,000 feet since 1990-something, three. So they all work at headquarters, or they work at remote control facilities around the country. So we have 16 uh, remote facilities, much like the one that is here at, at, uh, 
at this university. Um, and it's, it's basically a duplication of our control room in Waimea. So it turns out half of our observing has, someone remote, has no one at, in Hawaii. And three quarters of it has someone remote. So increasingly, people don't come to Hawaii. It's a tremendous loss. First of all, astronomers are no longer learning to surf. But more importantly, <laughs> they don't interact with our staff as much. And so we have to find other ways of trying to maintain that connection. Keck is very different than most of the other telescopes. Uh, the big telescopes. The other big telescopes run in what's called Q service mode, which means that um, when you submit your observation, they break it down into its smallest component parts. You know, maybe you want to observe this star for 10 minutes and that one for 10 minutes and this galaxy for a few minutes. And then they slice it all up and they find the optimum observing conditions when there's no clouds or the atmosphere is stable. And then the staff astronomer carries out the observation. And so you submit your proposal, and six months later you get your result. And if, you've, if your proposal, if you've got something slightly wrong, you'll get garbage back. Or if the staff astronomer didn't understand exactly what the right parameters were, he could have increased the exposure time perhaps, but he doesn't have that latitude, you, you, know, there's, you don't get good data. The positive side is, if you get what's called band A, you know, the best kind of observing conditions, you're guaranteed to get a result. At Keck, if you get time on the Keck telescope, uh, it's yours. You do whatever you want. Now, in principle, the proposal you submitted is the science you're supposed to do. But all that matters at the end is the papers you publish. So if you say, I want to go and study dark matter, and instead you decide to point the telescope at the moon, you can do that. Well, not the moon, okay, but anything else. Um, but when you next come to apply for time, your, your time allocation committee will say, what papers did you publish? And if you're doing stuff that's unrelated or it's n not producing results, you won't get the time. So it's sort of self-regulating. But the beauty of the system, okay, the bad part is if it's a cloudy night, you just lose your data. You know, you, you're out of luck. And you go back. You don't, you don't get a do-over. If you lose your night for technical fault or cloud or weather, you're simply out of the system. You can reapply six months later and you may or may not get the time. Someone else may have done the science. Uh, someone else's science may be judged better. So it's very, very competitive that way. But when you have the time and it's clear, um, if you're observing your target and you say, well, this is not what I thought, I'm going to do something different, you can use that time productively. Or you say, if I increase the exposure time by another 20 minutes, I'll get good data. You, can, you have that flexibility. And the jury is out on which of those two methods is better. Um, but what I can tell you is that judged on independent metrics, not by Keck, Keck is the most impactful observatory on planet Earth single observatory.